Hi everyone, this lesson is on the infectious disease known as Shigellosis. So Shigellosis is a bacterial infection of the gastrointestinal system caused by Shigella species. So Shigella is a gram-negative bacteria. It's also non-spore forming. It's a facultative anaerobe, which means that it can live anaerobically without oxygen, but it doesn't have to. And it's non-encapsulated. And there are four species of Shigella bacteria. These are known as Shigella sony or sonii, Shigella flexneri, Shigella boidii, and Shigella dysenteriae. So Shigella sonii is actually the most common Shigella species in the United States. And then Shigella flexneri is actually the most common cause of Shigellosis in developing countries. So the prevalence of each of these bacterial species is different depending on where you are in the world. Now, Shigellosis, or a Shigella infection, is one of the most common causes of bacterial gastroenteritis. It's actually the third most common cause. And it is also a significant cause of severe diarrhea in children in the developing world, especially children who are malnourished. And the most common age group that is affected by Shigellosis worldwide is from the ages of six months to five years of age. So very important cause of severe diarrhea in young children. So how do we become infected by this bacteria? So infection by this bacteria is going to be most commonly through the fecal oral route. So the fecal oral route is going to be where a patient is infected with this bacteria. It's going to be in their gastrointestinal system, and they're going to pass it through their feces into the environment. And due to some unsanitary practices or poor sanitation, it's going to contaminate certain things in the environment, and it's going to be picked up by an individual through oral consumption. And it's going to eventually infect that individual and get into their gastrointestinal system and the cycle is going to continue. So it's important to note that even when a patient has resolved the infection, they don't have the signs and symptoms of this infection, they can still shed the bacteria. So even after the condition is over, they can still shed this bacteria into the environment for up to six weeks. So very important to make note of as well. Most commonly, we're going to see people consuming certain products that are going to be contaminated, and these can include food and water. And it can also be passed between individuals, especially in close contact, in long-term care centers and daycare centers. So nursing homes, hospital settings, and daycare. And the reason that this can be the case is that this bacteria is very contagious. It only requires as little as 180 organisms to cause infection. Some sources say even as little as 10 bacteria can actually lead to an infection. So that's a very, very small amount or up to 200. So again, a very small amount. So this is why this condition is very contagious. So when an individual consumes something that's contaminated, either food or water, the bacteria is going to get into their stomach. And the acidity of the stomach is normally going to take care of most microbes. But with regards to Shigella species, it's relatively resistant to stomach acid, meaning that it can survive the stomach acid. And once it survives the stomach acid, it can pass through the stomach and into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. So it's going to enter into the small intestine. And when it's in the small intestine, it's going to multiply. And this is where we're going to see many of these organisms start to proliferate. So they start to multiply in the small intestine, and they eventually get into the large intestine. So we start to see these bacteria getting into the large intestine. Now, once the bacteria enter into the large intestine or the colon, they can invade colonic epithelium. The colonic epithelium is the inner lining of the large intestine. So they invade the colonic epithelium through M cells. And once they invade through M cells, the patient's immune system is going to send macrophages to the area. The macrophages can engulf the bacteria, but the bacteria can escape from the macrophages and cause other issues to occur. These include enterotoxin production, so they can produce toxins. And these toxins include enterotoxin 1 and 2. Shigella dysenteriae can produce its own cytotoxin as well, which can cause other issues, including bleeding to occur. All of this can lead to issues with poor nutrient absorption, fluid loss, and bleeding as well. So all this can lead to what we call bacillary dysentery. And the average incubation period is up to three days. So by the time patients consume these bacteria, it takes about three days before they start to have symptoms. Now they can have symptoms earlier on, even around 12 hours, but typically the average incubation period is going to be three days. So once they start to experience symptoms, they're going to have acute diarrhea. And acute diarrhea meaning that it's going to occur less than two weeks. So when we see diarrhea, we break it down into acute and chronic. Acute bacteria is going to be less than two weeks in duration. Chronic is going to be more than two to four weeks. And acute diarrhea less than two weeks is often going to be infectious. So this can help us determine that this is going to be due to an infection. 
So they're going to have acute diarrhea. And what's going to be characteristic with this diarrhea is that it can be watery or it can be bloody. This is going to be very important with regards to a Shigella infection. It can cause a bloody diarrhea. This is going to be different than other types of infectious diseases. And we can see predominantly being watery diarrhea with infections by Shigella sonii. And when patients do experience diarrhea, and if it is bloody, it's often going to be mucoid diarrhea at first. So they can have a bit of mucousy diarrhea, and then it can lead to a bloody diarrhea. We can also see abdominal pain occurring as well. So abdominal pain is going to have a sudden onset, very severe abdominal pain and crampy, and it can often be colicky. It can come in waves. And we can also see a very high fever with this as well. This is also going to be another very key characteristic with regards to a Shigella infection, very high fever up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit or 41 degrees Celsius. We can also see with this fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypotension. So tachycardia is going to be a heart rate above 100, tachypnea is going to be a respiratory rate above 20, and hypotension is going to be a low blood pressure. And then we can also see issues with urgency. So feeling like you need to go to the bathroom very urgently. So this can also lead to fecal incontinence. We can also see tenismus, so a feeling of incomplete evacuation. Dehydration can also occur as well. So this is going to be something that can occur in some patients due to that excessive diarrhea that they can have. So they may have dry mucous membranes, so their mouth becomes very dry. And then nausea and vomiting can also be another finding in some patients. And then lethargy, feeling very tired and unwell. And then seizures can occur in severe cases as an early manifestation. So especially in patients who are at high risk, patients who have a poor immune system, malnourished children, patients with immunocompromised from HIV or AIDS or other elderly patients. These patients can be at a higher risk for more severe infections. And then overall, symptoms of this condition can last for two to seven days. And then there are other medical conditions that can occur after having shigellosis. So even after the condition has resolved, patients are at a higher risk for having reactive arthritis. So reactive arthritis is a joint swelling, especially of the knees, that can occur approximately two to four weeks after Shigella infection. It's associated with HLA B27, and it's going to be more commonly seen in young male patients. And then some patients can also have what we call post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. A minority of patients can, even after having resolution of symptoms from this condition, they can have a persistent abdominal pain, diarrhea, or constipation. So it can alter their bowel habits for a longer period of time. And then some patients can also experience hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. This is where there's bleeding in the urine. This is something that is more likely to occur with a Shigella dysenterie infection. So that specific Shigella species that produces its own cytotoxin can lead to bleeding also from the urinary system as well. And then there are other severe complications. These are going to more commonly occur in immunocompromised patients. So again, young children, elderly patients, patients with immunocompromised from HIV or AIDS, type 2 diabetic patients. All of these patient populations are at a higher risk for having severe complications or severe signs and symptoms. And these include delirium, encephalopathy, coma, and anuria, or a cessation of urination. How do clinicians diagnose shigellosis? So a stool examination is going to be very important in diagnosing it. It's best to perform a stool culture in all patients that are suspected to have shigellosis and also do sensitivities to see how susceptible the particular bacteria is to certain antibiotics. And then stool ova and parasites can also be performed to rule out other possible causes. And then looking at a stool analysis, we can often see fecal leukocytes and fecal blood. This can often be seen in roughly 70% of patients. And then blood work can also be performed. A complete blood count will show anemia, thrombocytopenia, and a left shift of white blood cells. So we can see more band cells. These are more immature white blood cells or leukocytes. So this is going to be another key finding in this condition. So again, a left shift of leukocytes can be an important finding in this condition. And we can also see creatinine in blood urea nitrogen being elevated in cases of dehydration. Increases in ESR and CRP can be found as well. And then blood culture may be positive for the bacteria in severe and complicated cases. And then another finding or another marker that can be looked at is what we call stool alpha-1 antitrypsin. This can be elevated early on in infection. And then patients who don't perform well with medical treatment can also have higher levels of this marker as well. So this can be something to look out for if you're wondering whether or not the treatments that we're going to talk about in the next slide if they are effective. If they're not effective, we can still see high levels of this marker. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? 
So oftentimes it's going to be a self-limiting infection. So patients can have this infection and resolve on their own within two to seven days. But most cases is going to be important to treat with antibiotics due to those complications we talked about before. And before we can actually get those sensitivities back on those bacteria, it's important to start treating with empiric antibiotics. And these can include fluoroquinolones and third generation cephalosporins for high risk patients, especially patients who are, again, those groups we talked about before, young patients, very old patients, patients with HIV or AIDS, and patients from other countries that have traveled internationally, especially from the African continent, due to some of those Shigella species causing more severe infection. And another important empiric antibiotic that can be used in pediatric patients is azithromycin. So those are all going to be the empiric antibiotics, but once the cultures and sensitivities have come back, then we can narrow the antibiotic down to what the bacteria is actually susceptible to. Shigella has become very resistant to many different antibiotics. These ones that we just mentioned here as the empiric antibiotic treatments still show enough effectiveness for most Shigella species. So they're the ones that are often going to be used empirically. But once we get cultures and sensitivities back, we can then narrow the antibiotic down to something that can be more targeting to that particular bacteria that's infecting the patient. And if you are not to treat patients, especially patients who are high risk, they are at an increased risk for having fulminant dysentery. Now, there are some other supportive measures that we should do as well. These include hydration, so keep the patient hydrated, make sure they have enough electrolytes and antipyretics or anti-fever medications to help reduce their fever because, again, they have a very high fever. And after they've had a resolution of their symptoms, after the infection has resolved, they may still have a little bit of irritation of their gastrointestinal system. So it can be important to start on a clear fluid diet, followed by low fiber and lactose-free diet for a certain amount of time. So this can give their gastrointestinal system some rest. And then another important point I want to make note of here is that nutritional supplementation can be very important in certain patient populations, especially malnourished children. So it has been found that 200,000 units of vitamin A given to malnourished children can help resolve symptoms quite significantly. And then zinc supplementation can also be important in malnourished children as well, which have shown reductions in signs and symptoms of this condition and overall improvement after the condition has resolved. And one other important point to make note of is that we should not use anti-motility medications to treat diarrheal symptoms in shigellosis. So anti-motility medications are medications like lopiramide. So anti-motility medications can be used in other diarrheal conditions to help treat diarrheal symptoms. But in the case of shigellosis, if we use anti-motility medications like lopiramide, we can actually worsen complications. So very important to not use anti-motility medications in this condition. Please check out my lesson on Clostridium difficile and norovirus. And if you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.